So, hi, I'm Tom Evans, and welcome to another edition of the, the Zone Show. And I'm so thrilled to have back on the show. And can you believe it was 2013 since when we had our first chat? Serge Beddington, Barons, how are you, Serge? Hey, I'm very good, and nice to see you again after um, seven years, Tom. But it doesn't sound, it doesn't seem that long. I, I listened back to our conversation, and it sounds like we had it yesterday. It's one of those bizarre things. Well, I think time works in extraordinary ways. And you sometimes see old friends and you continue the conversations that that happened, you know, sort of 25 years ago when you saw them at school. And I think with different people, different time, space, continuums exist. So that's interesting because I have the same um, sense. And I think it's because we have a certain resonation together. We're both soul men. Well, you know? our, soul, our soul waves have attracted us. Uh, and, and we're, waves, yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about the soul today, your new book, um, Gateway. And here it is. Yes, Gateways to the Soul, Inner Work for the Outer World. Yes, Inner Work for the Outer World. And is that a very much a continuation then of the last book? Well, it's deeper. The last book was about heart. Mm -hmm. And this book's about soul, and I think soul comes through, we experience our souls mainly through the heart, but it kind of, this book deals more with how we bring soul into the world. The last book was more about how we awaken our hearts. So is the gateway to the soul, is the heart a gateway to the soul? The heart is a gateway to the soul, absolutely, because we have to open our hearts to connect with ourselves, or that's one of the main ways. We do connect in other ways, but but having heart is very important for having soul. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So we're going to have to recommend our listeners read both books then, which is kind of interesting. And I also should say that we're going to, we made a decision before this uh, podcast that we're actually going to have two podcasts because this book that I've just read of yours is huge. And I think to do it justice, we have to have two conversations. It just so happens the book's in two parts anyway, as we'll explain. So uh, we're going to be back on again within a few weeks that won't seem like seven years this time to talk about the second <laughs> half of the book. But the, the, the book is extraordinary. Also, I'm, I'm going to say there's another resonance there. Uh, the forward is by Steve Taylor, who um, I'm hoping to have on the show shortly as well. Now, Steve, I've got to thank because his book, Making Time, sent me off in a completely different direction. And that was the gateway for my soul to start investigating the subjectivity of time. So I've got to thank uh, Steve for that and uh, welcome him in, in advance to... Uh, to Steve's a wonderful man. Yeah. And um, next month we're going to do a webinar together. I'm not quite sure on what subject, but, but, um, but we get together and at conferences we bring our guitars and we and we entertain and we play good blues together and, um, and in fact steve helped me you know on my new number called um coronavirus blues are you going to treat us yeah yeah do you want one verse of coronavirus blues? i think we need it yes okay, okay man right coronavirus no no two verses yeah, on my little on my little ukulele. If you promise not to infect me, 
oh virus, I ain't gonna bother you too much. And actually, I'm gonna do the last verse because it is relevant and the prophecy has come true. And it goes like this. But if you stop Trump being elected, I'm going to forgive you just a little bit. So it has stopped Trump being elected. <laughs> well, we can, we can, I think you just summed up what we're going to talk about there in, in, in three <laughs> verses. Uh, uh, so thank yeah. you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Um, just maybe this could be the Christmas number one. I, 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 I buy it, that's for certain. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're a musician as well. But, I mean, you're a real musician, um, Tom. I just, you know, I'm just a little oh, I, I, sort I, of funky I, guy. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. <laughs> you know, I'll make it up as I go along. So, so actually, well, let's let's talk about those things. Let's talk about the virus. Uh, you, you mentioned them in the book. You, you don't mention by name. The Trump, but he's he's he certainly pops out there. And um, what I like of what what you've done with the book is one. I, I love making up new words, and I love the fact you've used the word ensoulment, which I think is uh, is is great. And also, you've you've kind of explained at the front of the book how we've enchained ourselves somewhat by the last uh, the excesses of the last few thousand years. I guess it's this is not just a recent thing, but we're in a kind of enchainment that uh, we're we're in, in the, on the cusp of being able to come out of? Well, when matriarchal consciousness ended and patriarchy came in, the feminine principle went into the shadows and the days of the shaman who honoured the soul of life was replaced by the hero conqueror in all the religions. And the mindset embodied actually by Trump that's about sort of conquest, the neoliberal vision, you grab what you can because the world is just um, a game to see who can grab the goodies away from the other people. You know, so went out of the window. And the, the story that most of us have been brought up in is a story that doesn't include soul. It's a story that talks about our separation from one another, our limitations. It's a story that says famine and war is inevitable. It's a story that only sees us as ego personalities. And it excludes the transcendental domain of who we are. And so we live in a soulless society, and that is why we have all the problems that we have today. At one level, soul is the antidote. And, um, and, and I feel that we have to have a return of soul. And the virus... I gave a webinar, if anyone wants to see it, they can, they can find it and sort of on my, on my website, searchbeddingtonbarons.com. Um, In that webinar, um, Tom, I called, so, um, I called the virus Fierce Grace because uh -huh. I think, you know, I think tragedies, if they don't kill us, which they can, they do have effect of waking us up. And there's been a lot more compassion. There's been a lot more consideration of our fellow human beings. There's been the emergence of what I think is a key part of all of us, the altruistic aspect. And you think of the dedication of those medical people on the front lines working in hospitals has been absolutely incredible. So, so, so I think that the important thing is the awakening of soul, but we need, but for soul to awaken, we need to see why it's gone to sleep. 
inside humanity as a whole and inside many of us. Because here I think you'll agree, Tom, that if we don't act soulfully, it's as if we don't have soul. You know, it's so far, it's so dormant, it's so asleep in us, it's so caged up that it's as if we don't have soul. And Trump is a very good example of an absolute soulless human being. I mean, I won't go into a description of him because we all know that. But it's not as if Trump doesn't have soul, but it's just very, very deeply buried under all his woundedness, under all his conditioning. So even Hitler had a soul. Even um, all authoritarian leaders who sort of who are in love with power instead of um, honoring the power of love, they all have souls, but it's sleeping. So the name of the game, Tom, is how do we inside ourselves, in our work, in our business, out in the world, how do we help? sort of how do we coax the sleeping soul out of hiding? <laughs> Apart from just writing a book like you've written, is it just by example? Is it is it an example of a nice infection? You know, where COVID is maybe a not so nice infection, although it's, it might have some good um, benefits in, in the long term. Uh, but is if, if everyone acts in a more soulful way, does it kind of pass on? I think it needs to... I think it needs to happen outwardly and inwardly. I think I notice that when I'm around very soulful people, it brings out the best in me. So we need to choose to be around people who are soulful because something of their atmosphere kind of enfolds us. I'm very lucky. I feel my wife is a wonderfully soulful person. And she does much, just by her presence and her goodness, to coax my own soul out of hiding. But then at the same time, we've got to address in a very concrete way as activists for a new world, because I think we need to be activists for a transformed world. We need to address the many areas of our world where soul does not raise its head and we need to bring soulfulness into corporations. We need to bring soulfulness into the way we deal with our economics. We need to bring a soulful spirit into um, our, our handling of the planet. And, and, at the, and the great enemy of soul, Tom, is the system. The system is like a soulless vampire that grabs hold of us and it sucks our blood and keeps us in a condition of pain and anxiety. And it fears soulfulness because the, because the system will begin to collapse if more and more soulful people come to the fore. So it does its best to whisper a little story, don't go for all this soulful stuff. It's all a load of cobblers, really. So I mean, <laughs> so, so we've got to address it both inside ourselves. How do I and how do you, Tom, how do we both bring our souls into operation and out in the world? What areas do we work to help bring soul into the world? And you, by, you know, one area that you do is through your beautiful recordings, which I've been listening to, your incredible sort of music, your soulful music, and your guided meditations into soul, and giving radio and, um, and video programs like this. That's how you bring soul into the world. So we've got to find... What is our path of soul? And when we find it, the interesting thing that happens is that we feel we have guidance. Where we feel that the force is with us. And that's the important thing. There's a great soulful power in the world 
and we need to align with it and have the force be with us. And I think the force is beginning to be with the Democrats in America, and I think that all Trump's attempts to um, uh, to disenfranchise America, that the soulful power of democracy is beginning to to come back. So I'm seeing that the force is with Joe Biden and and the force is going out of Donald Trump. Indeed, and I think today, uh, we're, we're recording this on the 24th of November, uh, there's, there's uh, news reports that he's finally capitulated, which is which is great. And I, I'll just draw people to a, a very brief zone show episode I did uh, called Five Minutes for Donald, what I'd do if I was given five minutes for Donald, and, and three of them were just showing kindness to him, and one whole minute was just sitting in silence with him, just letting that, that soulful essence that I might possess leak over to him in some way, so... Uh, I'll draw people to that. And I'll also draw people's attention to the fact that um, this is a Zone Show podcast, but the Zone Show itself is a movement I started seven years ago. And it's funny that seven years later, when you're writing this book, Gateways to the Soul, I write in Soul Ways, producing the Soulful Path Meditations and what have you. And we've both been drawn to this work and our souls have also been drawn together. And uh, and what I love about the a soulful energy is it's not just a metaphorical force, it's a real universal force that brings the right people together at the right yeah. time. Yeah, and I like the idea, I think there's many different kinds of friendships that we have, and you and I have a soul buddyhood, and I meet my soul buddies when I go to conferences, when we deal with the different work we're doing, and so buddies are not people that we see every day and invite to lunch every day. You know, they don't live close, but we have a deeper connection. So we're united in our desire to make a difference in the world. And I'm very much in touch with my soul mates, my soul buddies at the moment. And, and we're all empowering each other. And I think that that is fantastic. And if we don't talk for another year, we're still soulmates because we know we're there to support and help each other in the work we're doing. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done for the transformation of our of our planning. Indeed. And I feel like um, I don't really want to talk too much about the the, the past. Because I tend to be this eternal optimist, always looking forward, always entangling with the, the perfect future. But I think because the first part of this book does go into it in some depth, I think it'd be useful for people that are maybe just at the beginning of this journey or just the, the very cusp of awakening, just to talk about a few concepts that you mentioned in the book. And one that I've not heard about before called Wetiko, um, which it sounds like to me like a spiritual COVID in a way. It is. Um, it is, it's kind of like a spirit of, it, it's like a demonic spirit that can get into people when they're utterly um, obsessed with power, control, materiality. And I think that, again, I have to, name him once more, that the, the outgoing American presidents is someone who is possessed by this dark spirit, and through him it spread to his enabling Republicans who've enabled his criminality and his destruction of democracy. And I think that we... We can't be naive. It's not enough to just sort of sit around and, um, you know, and just hope for the best. I sent out a newsletter a couple of weeks ago that said we have to take evil on. That's, that is the role of the soul person. We can't, you know, if we don't see evil in the world for what it is, and if we don't address it and take concrete stands for goodness, um, it's going to spread. So um, that's what the Wetico sort of virus is. 
um, I think Mitch McConnell and I think other people in the Republican Party are obsessed by it, as is, as is Putin and President Xi in, in, um, in, in China. It's about power and control. And so that we can see that the world at this moment, that there's a great struggle between those forces that want to move forward to create a new and better world. In other words, the forces of soul and those forces that want to keep the old order alive where the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, there's injustice and inequality. And so the soul forces have to be stronger than the Wetico forces, because Wetico is very, very powerful at this moment, and it doesn't want to die. It will do anything to not die. Trump will do anything, you know, he'll, you know that he would almost murder to stay in power. Because that's that's what the Wetico does, and I think to just relate this to your idea, Tom, of the zone, I I understood the zone because I'm a tennis player when I would really play well, and I used to be a ski racer when I would ski well. But if you have, if you're possessed by the Wetico, you can never get in the zone. It kind of, it sort of crushes your spirit. You just become a sort of desperate ego, sort of clawing to get all the power and all the money and everything to yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, some time ago, I learned I learned how to um, do what effectively like a modern day exorcism. So, if if, if an individual yeah. uh, was to present themselves uh, to me and a number of other people, I can do this as well. Then I learned how to. Um, cast out that wet ago and replace it with new energies. How would a sort of more macro and global exorcism take form? Tremendous question, isn't it? Mm. I think I'll tell you a lot of people are doing Elgin Bash, who wrote his book, LSD and the Mind of the Universe, have written, and I also just recently wrote an essay called um, Breakdown or Breakthrough, Look into the Future. What I think is that the deepest changes that need to happen are not going to happen unless humanity is in a terrible crisis. And I well, think, are. yeah, I think, I think that, but it may not be severe enough. Okay. I think that the good people have to take stands for their goodness and do what they can. Um, you know, and for me, the good people are those who work for the environment, who work, you know, to, you know, to, to help women who've been abused, who, who stand for goodness in the world, that's very important to take a stand because actually there's a tremendous power in goodness and sort of people tend to think that there's only power in brute force. I think there's a kind of soul power that exists and very good people are able to have an incredible effect much more than they know it. Like Ramana Maharshi, the great Indian saint who did all his teaching in, um, in, um, in silence, he had a tremendous effect in India. And transcendental meditators have explored when they've gone into um, sort of dangerous zones in in big cities and they've meditated there, that the crime rate has gone down enormously. So the power of meditation, the power of taking a stand for goodness in the area in which you work, the power of just treating our fellow human beings as we would wish them to treat us is very, very strong. 
And have you noticed there seems to be a lot of young, old souls on the planet right now? So Absolutely. People, they, they, they seem to have many years of experience and depth which goes way beyond their years. And a lot of old, young souls as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I tell you, Tom, my daughter, she's 20, she's studying global politics and human rights. She's such a wise little soul. My, my wife's daughter, who's the same age, wise girl. They know about the problems in the planet and their lives are going to be about addressing them. Very different from us when, you know, when I was young in the hippie area, you know, I just wanted love, not war. I wanted to turn on, tune in and drop out. Now the young people are really dropping in. And I'm so touched by, by, by people like um, that young um, Asperger's girl who stands up for the environment. Um, Greta Thunberg. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Her or that um, Indian girl who was um, shot by the Taliban in the head because she wanted sort of women to be educated, um, Malala. I think there's many people like her and they're going to come up to the fore. And there's a whole new consciousness of, of new people, sort of millennials and, and sort of people who were born this century who are beginning to come to the fore. And so I have a lot of hope because it's really a question of the balance of consciousness. And I think a new consciousness is being born on the planet. I think a new, and it's very important, this new consciousness. And so, so that's why I have a lot of hope. And you point, you point of this why? in the book, The Gateways uh, to the Soul. So uh, we're going to talk about in the, in the, the second um, edition of this interview about how we uh, open the gateways and enter the gateways. But I want to give people a bit of a taster before we close on this interview. How wide open is the gateway right now, would you say? And how do you take the first steps towards going through it? Okay, great question. First, I'm going to say that, that in times of difficulty, the spiritual forces, the higher dimensional forces are closer to humanity to help us in our evolutionary journey. So at one level, it's, there's more gates available and it's a little bit easier to go through them than it was, say, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm because we're receiving help from the higher dimensions of consciousness. And if, and if you read the esoteric teachings in all the great world religions, they all talk about, you know, sort of higher consciousness and beings existing on other dimensions of life. And I personally have had experience of this in many ways. So, so that's the first thing. We are getting help. Those who are willing to take a stand for a better world are being helped by the forces of spirit. Secondly, how do we ourselves take, take steps to go through the gates? Well, we need to do what is true for us. I need to work with people. I need to write. I need to teach. I need to talk that opens my gates. I need to treat my wife in a gracious way. I need to honor my obligations. And I also need to do things that give me joy. It gives me joy to swim in the ocean. It gives me joy to play tennis. It gives me joy to read poetry. I'm just rereading Anna Karenina at the moment. It's giving me such joy. We need to do things to open up the joy space because that opens up the heart. And so we need to do the things that feel right for us, 
that sort of make our hearts sing. So it's not just about struggle. I've got to struggle to, to, to awaken my soul. Yes, there is struggle at this time, but we also need to surrender into the joy. That's very important. And do um, as Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist, said, I've lived a life where I've tried to honor my bliss. And we need to do the things that are right for us. So I feel sorry for my old university friends who've been institutionalized. They've all retired now. You know, they've been bankers. They've been in institutions all their lives. They've had souls sucked out of them by the system. They're all exhausted. I'm happy that, they're, that they've retired because I've lived a life where I've never been institutionalized. I've done my own thing. I've, you know, I've created my own laws. I've, um, I've tried to live as a free spirit. And so I have all the energy in the world now. So, um, so I think it's not to sort of give in to age and say, I'm a certain age, I can't do anything. Wonderful. So can I just ask you, how do you bring soul into your life, Tom? What, what are the sort of catalysts for soul for you? Well, that's a great question, and it's an honour to be asked this question on uh, the show where I'm supposed to be asking the questions. And uh, well, I'm very interested. And it's only I can only no one's ever asked me that question in a way that I felt like giving an absolutely full and honest answer. So here you go. So um, some years ago, um, I went through a, a fairly major transformation. Uh, started meditating when I was 45. I'm 62 now, so that's 17 years. And then weird things started to happen. I studied with a couple of esoteric schools, one in Germany called the Cryon School, which is a, an angelic female magic school, and one in California uh, called the Builders of the Adetum, which is Kabbalah and Tarot. And I synthesized uh, male and female magic together. Uh, and this is me in the earth plane, in my density, if you like, the, the, the vehicle. Yeah. Soul. And then somewhere along the line, um, and it, it, was, it was subtle, uh, um, sometimes subtle, but also occasionally there were some switches. My soul walked in, so I became ensouled. Yeah. And, so, and then, then when I realised that it happened, I, the, the old Tom stepped back, and I literally started following my soul. And then you get up in the morning, you got one idea about what you might do, but then you do something completely different. And I must have went, I must have gone through that transition maybe five or six years ago, fully. Uh, because it's not just a switch, it's a, it's a, a set of stages. And then, but because my background is engineering, um, and I'm very good at reverse engineering stuff. I went, so what have I just been through? What process just happened to me? And wouldn't it be kind of interesting if I, ma if I, I made that process available to everybody? So, uh, yes, yeah, so I have I've, I've created 15 um, guided meditations called the Soulful Path. And if you follow them, you'll get the same sort of transformation. So I put those out there uh, for free on Insight, uh, on Insight Timer. And um, a few people are going through that. I did a talk on it the other week, actually, and some people started following the, uh, the, the path, which is kind of interesting. And so for me, the whole, um, that, that's what I did. So I, I've, given, I've given up. My soul is leading me. I'm being very much pulled by these higher forces you talk about. My book, Soul Ways, which is um, the novel yeah. I published earlier this year, um, that was a channeled novel about a future history of the earth that starts in 2058. It's based in Beijing and Wuhan, would you believe? And I've been to Beijing once, but I've never been to Wuhan. And it talks about how China become the dominant force on the, the world stage. I then started to write in, in lockdown. I wrote the whole sequel and prequel to it. And very much that is about how higher forces come in. I call it, it's called soul waves insertions. And it's how these higher forces enter the earth plane at times of transition and boy are we in times of transition now now to make this accessible to the to most people i've written it as fiction but it, it wouldn't do any harm if you just assumed it was true well 
we really both said the same thing in a different way. Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and I think the important thing is that soul, sort of people receive soul in different ways. You know, um, the great, um, um, oh dear, what's his name? Um, the great sort of Benedictine monk um, who died, well, she had a heart attack. And in his heart attack, he, the feminine side of his sort of nature opened and the softness came into being. So soul came into him, B. Griffiths, soul came into him through a heart attack, you know, and sometimes soul comes into someone through anything that shakes them up. And, and Gurdjieff said something important. Man is a lazy old bastard. He didn't actually put it like that. He put it more eloquently, but here's how I'm putting it. Man is a lazy old bastard. He tends not to wake up unless hit by a, by a shock greater than the sum of his own inertia. And I think that that's true. And certainly in my own life, I've had a few shocking events, and they've helped to wake me up. Because what we're really talking about, Tom, is awakening. You know, the process of awakening beyond our ego identity. Because the problem with all of us is we think we're just this ego, this ego self, um, our personality. And we have an ego self. And the name of the game is not to get rid of ego, because actually you can't. It's very canny, and it'll find ways to sneak back. But the name of the game is to open up the deeper dimensions of who we are, the soul self, and allow that to be to take charge. And the interesting thing is that I found in my work that when people's ego self is healed, when they've done the psychological sort of healing, they've healed their wound from childhood, ego is actually happy to stand aside and let its older brother, soul, come in. So ego does not vanish. You know, the name of the game is not to become egoless. No great sage, and I've met quite a few of them, is egoless. They often have tremendous egos, but they have tremendous souls, so that the soul is the one in charge, not the ego. The problem in the world is that the janitor if you have a corporation and there's a janitor who is in charge of sort of making sure that the premises are secure at night, his role is not to sit in the CEO seat and run the corporation. His role is to make sure the corporation is, you know, secure at night. But what has happened in the world is that we have janitors in the top position. And there we have Trump, who who basically ought to be a janitor sort of guarding the gate at night. That's all he's capable of. But this monstrously wounded ego, you know, sitting up there in the director's seat, that's, that's the difficulty in the world. And I think we need to get the right people into positions of power. And that, again, comes back to your question of what, you know, that we can do to bring soul into the world. We need to somehow have soulful people in positions of power, Tom. Well, I think it's, I've got to say, just uh, going back to um, when you started that, uh, that answer, the first is the first insertion in this book is about a near-death experience where somebody goes to the light and comes back with the extrasensory powers. And then the ninth insertion is a very nice treatise on ego and how ego isn't actually about this. What we call ego is actually about the consciousness, which is the bridge between the higher dimensions and the so-called lower dimensions. They're only lower because they're down here. But uh, uh, so interesting that you and I are talking, we're writing, talking and thinking about the same things from two lovely different angles, which is great. 
So I'm going to suggest that we we come back and visit this. It's nice to go through this history. I'm going to put a ban in the next interview on the word, the name Trump. We don't need to talk about him because by the time we talk next time, he will be history, which is fantastic. And uh, and we're going to talk about the gateways, the many, many gateways, because you don't talk about one gateway in the book. You talk about many gateways to the soul. But... Um... So I think the last thing I'm going to say is that while we want to go through the gateways, there's always a resistance. And many of us fear the sublime. Many of us fear being who we could be. Many of us fear joy. Many of us fear ecstasy. Many of us fear standing in our power as human beings. So there are cases when gateways open in front of us, and all we have to do is just um, is just walk through, but we turn away. And that is another of our challenges to to realize our magnificence as human beings and most of us spend more time castigating ourselves for all our, our faults as opposed to honoring and bringing to life the divine dimensionality of who we are. So the more we focus on that, the more the gates are going to open easily. And again, as I said earlier, Tom, there are forces from higher levels of consciousness that are with us and in zone states when we're open these forces can work through us more powerfully i would totally agree so in the next uh, conversation we're going to talk about wd40 to oil the gates uh, to open easily more easily and how we can enable them to open in front of us at the right time timing is very important as well we can we'll come on to that too so uh, Serge it's been an honour and a pleasure uh, and also the fact that uh, the next conversation is not seven years away uh, we're going to say just about two or three weeks away I hope this side of uh, this side of the new year bless you Tom I'm great to talk to you yeah.